together. Tonight, the question we want to dive into is what is the church? It's a very fundamental question because everything else is going to draw on and build on top of that answer. What is the church fundamentally? What makes a church what it is? Um, and in order to answer that, we're going to open our Bibles and see what the Bible says about the church. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open first to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I'm going to read that now. It says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The first thing we want to see when we're discussing what the church is by nature, is that it is a gathering of God's people. That is what the church is. It is the gathering of God's people. We see that in the verse we just read as believers who received the word of God, the gospel, this proclamation that Peter was doing on Pentecost, those who received the risen Jesus Christ himself, who believed in that message, because what Peter was proclaiming on that day was that Jesus lived, died, and rose again from the dead, and that we need to repent, turn from our sin, and turn to Christ in faith. And it says that all who did so, all who received that word, they were added to his church. And furthermore, it's a, it's a community that these people were then gathered into. It was a fellowship, one marked by devotion. You see that they devoted themselves, what, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. They devoted themselves to fellowship. It says that they shared meals with one another. Furthermore, it says they shared resources with one another. They shared their lives. They prayed for one another. They knew each other well enough to know what was going on in each other's lives. There was a devotion to one another and to fellowship as they gathered together. In fact, this devotion is so strong that churches are often called covenant communities. And we're going to talk about briefly what a covenant is. A covenant is a formal, a solemn promise. Some people have described it as kind of a unity between law and love. A covenant can be something as strong as passing a law or signing a contract, but it's also something that isn't as cold as the legal system. It is something that brings in the warmth of love itself because it's entered into deliberately, joyfully, out of a devoted and committed desire to love more, deeper, and truer. That's why we discuss marriage as a covenant. It is something that is recognized by the government, that is witnessed to by people. But for the husband and wife, the marriage is something so much more. Um, it is two people who have chosen to love, to serve one another for the rest of their lives. A covenant is the same kind of thing. The church, by trusting in Jesus Christ, they've been added to this community. The Bible says we've entered into a new covenant with God. It's a relationship that is sealed with Jesus' blood. It's a relationship where God has eternally committed himself to the church, where the church is forever God's people. When we become a part of the church, we covenant alongside each other as members of this promise that we've been given from God, this promise that he will always be with us, that he will never forsake us, that we belong to him and he belongs to us. As we enter into community with one another at a local church, um, we participate and see that covenant. And we can covenant alongside one another. We can commit to be that kind of church for each other. We can commit to reflect God's love to one another. To reflect that kind of commitment that we are already participants of because we are part of God's church. We are called to be the means of God's fellowship with us as we lay down our lives in service, as we lay down our lives in love for one another. So the reality is the gospel doesn't just save us and then send us on our way. 
Um, Christianity is not a, a solo adventure. It is being born into a family. It is being saved into a community. It is being added to the number, the fellowship with God and with one another. It is a covenant community. It's the church of the living God. Now, the scriptures teach us that the church is actually something much larger than we often credit it as. The church is much bigger than Morningstar Christian Fellowship itself, than any local congregation um, at any place in the world. In fact, the Bible teaches us that the church is universal, it's global. That means the church is the gathering of all God's people from all time, all over the world. About 1,700 years ago, while the church was still relatively new, they gathered together and they were discussing what it was that made them who they are, what it was that they believed in their doctrine and, and thinking about God's word. And they came up with something called the Nicene Creed. And at one point in it, it talks about the church. It says, we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I won't get into what all of that means. But the emphasis that they were placing was that the church is one. Whether you are at a church in Rome or in the Philippines or in Scarborough, the church is one. It is not many denominations. Um, it is not simply the building. No, it is the people of God gathered globally and for all time, which means it includes those who have passed away, those who stand in the presence of God today, those, including the host of heaven, who are worshiping before God's throne. That is the church. All of those who have been saved by God's grace. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24 talks about this. It reads, You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What Hebrews is saying there is that in participating in worship at the local church or online on Sunday or Friday night um, as you listen to this message or whenever you have the opportunity to worship God, as the church, you are participating in a worship that's going on in heaven eternally. You are participating in the saints worshiping God before his throne, seeing him face to face. You're participating with the Father um, sitting on his throne, being able to behold him with the Son as a mediator of this new covenant and allowing us to approach that throne at all. The one who unites us by his spirit. The church, and my point here, is that it is global and universal. It is something so much bigger than yourself. It is something so much bigger than just the church building, and we undercut it when we view it as such. In Revelation, we see that there will be people from every tribe, nation, and tongue standing before the throne of God in awe and in worship. And that, brothers and sisters, that is the church of God.